Okay, you guys, our final step in the series for hip lecture, and it's hip injuries. So if you're not pumped, I'm pumped. Hopefully my voice pumps you up. Um, so we've talked about hip anatomy. We've talked about hip inspection and history questions that we would ask our patients. But now we obviously need to talk about the actual injuries that plague the hip. So this is certainly most of the injuries. I'm sure you've heard of others, but these are the ones that are most common in athletic training. So our first stop is the labrum. And you have to go back to the anatomy lecture to understand the important, the clinical utility of the labrum. Remember we talked about it. It's like an extension of the acetabulum. It provides or creates a suction for the femoral head to sit in that concave structure of the acetabulum, right? So it's massively creating stability about the coxal femoral joint, right, you guys? Good, I am glad you said that. So what are some of the mechanisms or causes um, that can lead to labral tears. So the, the list is exhaustive, but most often what we see in the field of athletic training um, is a patient who dislocates their hip, right? We can imagine if we have a traumatic femoral head dislocation, the head is going to slip out of the acetabulum and it only seems reasonable to suspect that the labrum would be torn in that process, right? Same thing with repetitive subluxations of the hip joint. By the way, you guys, those two pathologies are extremely rare because what did I say about about the hip joint it is massively stable okay so they're rare but when they happen they're catastrophic there are other pathologies that certainly can lead to labral tears in the hip are not as common in adult athletes but certainly are common in our prepubescent and adolescent athletes and that is the slipped capital epiphysis which we'll talk about in its own slide acetabular dysplasia which essentially means the acetabulum starts to wear away or starts to degenerate and as a result the the femoral head's going to slip out of out of the acetabulum and butt up against the labrum right okay and then we can we can have an athlete who suffers from a labral tear um, from repeated athletic trauma and so what do i mean by that imagine the volleyball player who's digging a lot and spending a lot of time in a hip flex position and landing in a hip flex position that's an indirect trauma that can lead to labral tears. But you certainly could have a lot of times we see this a lot in our running backs who are getting tackled at the hip. There's repeated anterior trauma to that hip. So those are examples. So in terms of hip subluxations, because that's really going to be the major cause for a labral tear, most often we see this patient, um, the mechanism of injury is falling onto a flex knee and the hip is abducted, right? So you can imagine like the the adductor group is just getting stretched. But in basketball, we see labral tears happen most often. When you do that, you're you're running, you're, you're dribbling down the court, you stop, jump stop, and then you pivot relatively quickly. That can also cause a labral tear. So what am I saying, you guys? There are many causative factors. Number one causative factor in sports is hip subluxation and or dislocations. So the signs and symptoms, I'm giving you differentials here. It's catching and locking. The labrum is a fibrocartilaginous structure. So when it's torn, if it flaps, it's going to cause the hip to catch and lock as that flap gets caught in the motion, right? And then we're gonna have what's called a positive scouring test. And we're gonna do that in lab and you'll see why it's positive. We're gonna load the femur and then rotate or grind that femoral head into the acetabulum and it will cause pain and sometimes clicking uh, for the patient. Okay, so the next pathology that we have is snapping hip or what is called co coxa sultans. Um, essentially, snapping hip is exactly what is being described right here. The hip snaps. Um, so typically, it's a palpable and audible snapping within the hip as the hip ex uh, extends um, and flexes. And there are three types, and we'll talk about them on our own slide. But let me show you what this looks like because it would almost be unbelievable, right? So when we think about snapping hip, remember as the hip flexes and extends, what we're going to see in this particular case, most likely the IT band is going to be slipping over. So watch this. Do you see it right there? See that snap? And we'll see it here in the video. Do you see that snap? Looks like tensor fascia lata, maybe IT band snapping over that greater trochanter, right? So I'm gonna pause that for just a second and then I'm gonna ask you a question. If that tensor fascia lata is snapping over that greater trochanter, 
what type of bursitis will that patient develop? Good, you said trochanteric bursitis most likely. Awesome. So what's the mechanism of injury? Most often it's going to depend on the type of uh, snapping hip. So let's look there. So we can have an internal hip snapping pathology. Most often that internal hip snapping pathology is caused by the iliopsoas anteriorly uh, and then secondarily the hamstring tendon posteriorly. Those are typically the two causes. But even more internal to that is the anterior iliofemoral ligament. Um, and that can also cause an internal type of hip snapping, one that's deep and not as palpable. And sometimes you can't even visualize it, right? What's most common, however, is the external form. The external form most often is going to be caused by the anterior fibers of that glute max. And as I mentioned or alluded to, the iliotibial band, I would say it's more proximal um, uh, origin uh, and also I would say the tensor fasciolata which is an extension right the IT band is an extension of of that but it can also be caused as a result of trochanteric bursitis imagine that that bursa is larger and so as that TFL IT band tries to snap over during flexion and extension it's snapping and the most common is external and you can also have intraarticular so the one pathology we just talked about that would cause a snapping hip syndrome would be a labral tear. But there certainly are other pathologies that can cause snapping hip syndrome. Again, most common are, are going to be here. So when I list mechanism of injury, it's really going to depend on the type of snapping hip, right? For the internal, it could be a tight iliopsoas that's causing it, right? An extremely taut iliofemoral ligament, right? For external, uh, most often, it sometimes is an excessive or an exostosis, exostosis off of the greater trochanter that's gonna cause that snapping. So the mechanism of injury is going to be dependent on the type of snapping hip syndrome. Okay, so the internal form, Palpable and audio, audible snapping within the hip um, as the joint flexes and extends. It's going to be common for all. Um, the signs and symptoms, here's what we know. Um, they have what's called a positive snapping hip sign. We'll do this in class. Um, and they'll have a positive jerk test. Uh, and we'll do this in class as well. So for now, I just want to talk about pathologies and assessments. And we'll do these tests in class, you guys. But essentially, both of these tests are going to stimulate that internal snapping hip to actually do what? To snap. Um, and so we said most often, it can be, occur as a lot of reasons, but the iliofemoral ligament is one of the major causes of that internal snapping hip syndrome. So in terms of evaluation, you're going to assess um, your patient's hip flexion and hip extension range of motion, and you're going to look for the point in the range of motion that the snap actually happens, right? So how do we treat um, snapping hip syndrome? Well, many of you just saw a, a patient getting ready to undergo surgery. Sometimes a physician will shave down a bone. Sometimes, depending on like, for example, if this ligament is just rubbing too much, they might split the ligament. It really just depends on the patient. It's going to be so independent. Believe me, so I know this. The external form, which is probably the most common, again, you're going to have that palpable, um, audible snapping. You'll see that's consistent across internal and external. Um, but the signs and symptoms are a little bit different. So there's a positive hip flexion extension test, uh, and then you have the positive jerk test as well. If you want me to tell you, like, take away textbook, really, you'll know the difference between the external and internal form because you'll visibly see that internal form, right? Or external form. You saw the video where you saw the snapping, that's the external form. You're going to see that because it's more superficial, external, superficial, that's kind of how I think about it. For this one though, it's going the treatment's going to vary. So for example, if we have an inflamed trochanteric bursa, then the physician will just go in, inject some cortisone and typically, that will solve the problem, right? So typically that will solve the problem and the external form goes away. Sometimes though, if it's as a result of that IT band, tensor fasciolata, then some stretching, some deep tissue, right? It's really going to depend on which anatomical structure is involved. The intraarticular form, similarly, you're gonna get snapping, joint flexes and extends. Um, with the intraarticular form, the signs and symptoms, notice a little bit different, positive hip extension, a deduction, right? 
Um, so we got to keep these things in mind, okay? And lateral rotation, okay? So external rotation. And then a, a jerk, a, a positive jerk task. So evaluation techniques, you're going to do this right here, right? You're going to look for snapping and popping or at least feel for snapping and popping or ask the patient if they feel that snapping and, and popping. Uh, and then the treatment is also going to vary with this form because if it's intra-articular it's going to depend on which anatomical structure is injured so example would be um, if it's a labral tear then we have to repair the labrum right that would be an example we would have to repair that the next pathology we're going to talk about is athletic pubalgia um, or the uh, infamous sport hernia it gets its name sports hernia because it occurs in a um, a different location than the traditional inguinal hernia what we know about athletic pubalgia or the sports hernia is most often the mechanism of injury is this right here increased muscular loads on the pubic bone um, and or the pubic symphysis. So you get this crazy tug most often from the adductor muscles, either they're tight, patient lands in an extreme A, B ducted moment and causes a massive stretching or pulling or tugging on that pubic bone. It can also happen as a result of a high velocity twist and turning. And certainly, as I said, muscular imbalances, tight A deductors that just tug on that pubic symphysis. So in terms of the signs and symptoms, um, one of the things that you'll see a lot with um, sports hernias is they're gonna be painful in the groin region, but one of the uncomfortable things about being an athletic trainer and having a patient with athletic pubalgia is you might actually have to palpate the pubic tubercle. So we'll do that in lab on ourselves, not on anyone else. So you can see just how weird and interesting that palpation is, but certainly something that must be done in the clinical setting, even if the patient is going to do it, right? Okay, we'll also see unilateral um, uh, adductor weakness. Sometimes that can be transferred bilaterally, but most often unilateral weakness on the side of the injury. And one of the differentials between an inguinal hernia and a sports hernia is most often they won't have that visible bulge. So that's why that is negative, okay? So in terms of your differentials, the things that we need to rule out, we need to rule out an adductor strain because an adductor strain is certainly different than um, an athletic pubalgia or sports hernia. We need to rule out an abdominal strain and we need to rule out the traditional hernia. One of the ways we rule that out is to look for the visible bulge, right? It will be negative with a sports hernia. So that brings me to my next pathology. Can you tell we're kind of progressing based on injury? So we just talked about uh, the sports hernia and how the adductors tug on the, the pubic bone and cause injury. Well, this is osteitis pubis. Osteitis pubis, as the name implies, it's an itis. So it's an inflammation of the pubic symphysis most often. It can happen as a result of micro and or macro trauma. So a micro trauma would be repetitive hip abduction that causes a tugging of the adductor muscle group on the pubic um, area where they attach. Or a macro trauma could be one massively extreme uh, abduction moment which causes an acute trauma or injury. Um, so signs and symptoms, oh, that patient is going to have pain anytime you have them abduct their hip. They're going to have pain in the pubic region, so you may have to actually palpate that. And they're going to be tenderness to palpation um, on the adductor longus. The biggest differential for me is um, they're going to have pain with changes in directions, right? Now, you might say, well, Dr. Cosby, what's the difference between a sports hernia? Let's go back and let's back up a little bit. Um, most often, if we're looking at this, um, the groin region is all across the groin. If we're looking here, we're just saying maybe the adductor um, longus is going to be impacted by that. And then here, we don't have that change in direction, right? Whereas here with osteitis pubis, we absolutely do. So we want to consider the differentials and those differentials are gonna be similar. So sports hernia, adductor strain and hip flexor strain. Now, one of the ways that we're gonna have to differentiate is to actually send them out for, for x-rays, right? to look at whether or not we have separation or inflammation within that pubic synthesis, right? It isn't something that we should, we can palpate or get a good feel for, for lack of better words. In other words, we won't be able to feel inflammation in the pubic region. So we might as well refer out and get that x-ray just to make sure. The adductor strain is here. The mechanism of injury can either be hypercontraction and or um, a stretch to the adductor muscle group. You guys already know what I'm gonna say about this. In terms of signs and symptoms, 
Anytime we have a strain, it's pain with active contraction. So contraction into adduction and passive stretch. I move that patient into hip abduction. So that's easy. Those are your special tests. They're gonna be tendered to palpation, but the differential is pain with active contraction and pain with passive stretch. Our differentials are sports hernia, osteitis pubis, and hip flexor strain, right? So you can see how we have multiple pathologies that we talked about back to back that are going to present similarly. We've talked about the sports hernia, we've talked about osteitis pubis, and now we're talking, talking about the adductor strain. So the cutting triad or the triad, right? So if we look at this image, um, what we're essentially seeing is that we have three pathologies that all present themselves. Um, and what we know about this is sometimes it will lead to what we call is um, functional impingement about the hip. So we want to assess these pathologies, um, treat them so that we don't suffer from a, an impingement where the patient has to adjust the way in which they use that hip and essentially secondarily, it leads to impingement, um, which is more difficult to cure than any of these injuries, right? What we can also see is that if we're looking at this Venn diagram is that these injuries are somewhat interrelated. Can you all see that? And so it may very well be that a patient had an adductor strain that progressed to isteitis pubis or had a sports hernia that progressed to osteitis pubis, so forth and so on. So there are other stretch strains that can occur at the hip joint. And I thought I would spare you 40 minutes of a lecture and just literally copy and paste the um, table that is in your book. So you can have a strain to the erectus femoris, the iliopsoas, the quads, hamstrings, glute max, and the adductor muscle group, right? This column here I love because it's going to tell you the mechanism of injury. And then last but not least, it's going to tell you what motions your patient is going to have pain with. So if I'm you, I screenshot this and I use this to study for the exam because you certainly will be asked to differentiate between, let's say, erectus femoris and an iliopsoas strain, right? Because at the hip, they both flex. But at the knee, we know that the erectus femoris also extends the knee, right? And so those are things that will become important when we're thinking about manual muscle testing and differentially diagnosing. So own this, not just for my class or for the next class to follow, but own it because you want to be lifelong clinicians who know how to test these particular muscles and um, strains. Okay. Now, next is myositis ossificans. Myositis ossificans or uh, heterotrophic ossificans, depending on which textbook you ask, um, occurs as a result of an actual quad contusion. So most often the patient presents to you with a quad contusion and then they take repeated blows after the initial onset. So a mechanism of injury most often is a direct blow, but it's multiple direct blows. It doesn't have to be in one event, it could certainly happen over time. So in terms of signs and symptoms, your patient's going to present with decreased range of motion. And it depends on if it's in the quads, which most often it is, that patient won't want to flex their knee because as they flex their knee, the quads are going to move over it. And just imagine tiny needles in your quadriceps, and then it just kind of scrapes as you're moving. If the myositis ossificans has been allowed to grow over time, or if osteophyte formation has been allowed to perpetu has been perpetuated, what you will feel is a palpable hard mass within the actual quadriceps itself. So in terms of differentials, we need to rule out a quadriceps contusion, a quadriceps strain, and a femoral fracture. Now we can do all of these easily, right? A contusion will feel soft. We just said there's a palpable mass, so there's a differential. A quadriceps, um, a quadriceps strain, they're gonna have pain with active contraction, which may hurt, um, and passive stretch, right? So we have to figure out, uh, what's the difference? Differential is going to be the palpable mass. We wouldn't have a palpable mass with a quadriceps strain, right? Unless, of course, it's completely ruptured and the muscle has rolled up. With the femoral fracture, we're gonna do a torque test, and that's gonna tell us whether or not it's a femoral fracture. So we can see how we're doing the differential test. So please close your eyes if you don't like bloody items, but I kind of want you all to appreciate 
the importance of diagnosing a quad contusion relatively early on. Because if you don't, in particular, as is the case with field hockey, lacrosse, and soccer athletes, a lot of times those athletes are taking sticks or blows to the anterior thigh. And so they are the ones that are going to suffer most from myositis ossificans. And if we allow that to happen and we allow it to perpetuate and we don't treat it, then essentially you see how all of this osteophyte has just um, grown off of the femur, right? That physician now has to go in and cut all of that out, taking with it some of the muscle fibers. So let us not be that clinician. Let's treat that contusion conservatively so that we, we don't have to have our patient end up here. One of the treatment options is what you see here. Um, the patient is going to be in a knee flex position um, and most often you're going to put ice on that patient. But keep in mind, they truly have that myositis ossificans. They're not going to want you to put them into that flexion moment. So it may require two clinicians to help you get that patient in, in a position, right? Okay, so the next pathology that we have is an iliac crest contusion, um, most often caused by clumsy patients, uh, but it, the mechanism of injury is most often going to be a direct blow to the iliac crest. Um, I've also seen this occur when patients are walking in their their houses and they bump, you know, their hip on a table. And so then they have the iliac contusion, but the mechanism is certainly a direct blow. How that direct blow occurs is just up to the patient. If it's an athletic participation or at home, we're still going to treat that pathology the same. So the signs and symptoms for an iliac crest contusion um, are going to vary, but certainly the top three signs and symptoms that are similar across patient cases are going to be the tenderness to palpation. But most often I don't start with that, right? Because if we're, if we're dealing with a contusion, the last thing I, I do is a, a palpation test, right? Because they're going to be painful. Um, but we'll also see the ecchymosis and, and obviously the superficial capillary um, bleeding into the iliac region. And then they'll have limitations in hip motion in particular, the two most often are going to be hip abduction, and then um, they'll also complain of pain in hip adduction, but that's because we're getting that stretching moment of the tensor fascia lata. So in terms of differentials, uh, when you have a patient present to you with this amount of ecchymosis, then you certainly have to rule out a fracture to the iliac crest. Although rare, certainly should be ruled out. Uh, and because of the location of the injury, we the other differential is a tensor fascia lata strain and um, or rupture, which is extremely rare, but certainly should rule it out when you can. Okay, so for, for moral neck stress fractures, I've been kind of referring to them a little bit, but we'll actually talk about them here. Most often, 90% of the cases that present in the clinical setting are as a result of repetitive stress um, and some, some um, form of overuse, right? What others? Uh, repetitive loading and jumping, but most often we see this in our running, um, in our gymnasts and our um, malnourished individuals, right? Uh, very prevalent in endurance athletes. One of the top injuries, in fact, right? So what are the signs and symptoms? You already know the sign and symptom for a stress fracture. What is it, you guys? Good. So I'm hoping that you all said um, that night pain is probably one of the most commonly reported. But remember that night pain isn't just, oh, it hurts at night. It's I cannot sleep up, sleep. It's waking me up kind of a night pain, right? Um, so then essentially you also have other signs and symptoms, but the differential to me, the key is, is that night pain that's reported, but certainly a deep seated hip pain that's untouchable to palpation. Now, of course, we can think of other pathologies that might present that way, right? An acetabular labrum tear would be an example of one. That internal snapping hip syndrome would be another one that would be um unpalpable. So you kind of have to use your night pain probably as your differential diagnostic until you uh, test until you actually can get some a set of images, right? Um, the patient is going to have limited range of motion. Uh, most often it's going to be um, limited most in extremes of abduction. And that's because you're getting a torque on that femoral neck, right? So the question always becomes in, in, in the field of athletic training, whoa, do we treat this conservatively and allow that patient to rest um, or is surgical fixation actually required, right? And so I'm gonna have you guys go back to the first lecture where we talked about forces that are transmitted from the foot to the hip joint and where we talked about the role of the hip joint, right? Where the 
the role of the hip joint is then to transfer those forces to the spine, right? So if we think about that, um, we can certainly treat it conservatively be because we know that there isn't much force being distributed through the hip in a standing position. But if our patients run, if our patients jump, then we know that those forces spike, right? So the question to you is, if we treat it conservatively, then that patient truly does need to rest. And if not, if you know you have a patient who isn't going to rest, who isn't going to obey the treatment protocols, then surgical fixation is um, most often recommended. Remember, we do have those circumflex arteries, which are delivering um, or supplying blood flow to the neck. But sometimes what we see is it's not enough. So it's really going to depend on the location of the stress fracture as well. So if we look at this image, you can kind of see the stress fracture here at the femoral neck. One of the biggest concerns about um, a femoral neck stress fracture is it becoming um, a full fracture and then you have this slippage, right, of the femoral head away from its actual femoral body. So that's a big, it's a big concern. Um, and so the, it's one of the things that will drive whether or not you can treat conservatively or surgically fixate. Hard part with the hip, right, is can you cast it? Sure. Um, is it ideal? No. So what does rest look like in the hip, right? I mean, most of the patients will have to get around some way, shape or form. So does rest look like a wheelchair, even though you're still loading the hip? What does rest look like? Which is one of the challenges with your femoral neck stress fractures. Okay, we have a femoral shaft fracture and I'm excited because when we're in clinical class, I'll show you guys how to actually use uh, a traction splint. So I'll bring a traction splint so we can play with that. But with a femoral shaft fracture, this isn't something that can be splinted with our traditional vacuum splints. We'll actually need what we see on this slide here, which is a traction splint. Um, in terms of mechanism of injury, you'll see it there. It's, it's usually direct contact contact or sometimes um, if a patient has had a stress fracture in the femoral shaft and jumps the wrong way um, or loads the wrong way then certainly the the femur will fracture the biggest concern with a femoral shaft fracture um, is the massive amount of force that the quads exert um, when the femur gets fractured and so what you'll see happening um, clinically is the quads will massively contract and kind of pull those fractured pieces across one another. And so this traction splint is, is awesome because you'll pay, place the patient's heel here. Um, you'll put this portion um, just underneath the ischial tuberosity and you're literally going to pull those bones um, into their normative positions. And then straight to surgery, uh, these patients go, right? Okay. So, um, arthritis, certainly something that we as athletic trainers don't see very often, but I also know that some of you are going into physical therapy. Um, some of you are going to become a PA. And so you'll see osteoarthritis um, of the hip in, in older patient populations, although it isn't um, uncommon in the younger populations. It's not something we see very often in, a, in, the, in the younger athletic population. And so what I placed on this slide here is just the kind of the criteria for assessing osteoarthritis of, of the hip um, and allowing you to make that, that judgment call about whether or not a patient has osteoarthritis and whether or not we need to refer out um, to see what type of treatment we need to get that patient. So the other pathologies that we're going to talk about um, are, I, uh, are unique and rare, but certainly something that we have to discuss because if we don't, you'll see it and you won't know what to do with it. Okay, so piriformis syndrome, um, many of you have dissected down to this muscle. So I think it's exciting to actually under, to see the muscle and to see the, its relationship to the sciatic nerve. Um, because this picture on this slide does it no justice whatsoever. But what we know about the piriformis muscle, right, is that the sciatic nerve lies just deep to that to that muscle. So when we're thinking about a piriformis syndrome, what we're basically describing is um, an anatomical abnormality, abnormality where the piriformis, for one of three reasons, might actually cause compression on the sciatic nerve and cause um, neurovascular uh, issues down the chain. So when we think about the mechanism of injury, it can be acute. So a patient can take a, a blow to the glutes, which um, causes inflammation of the piriformis and then presses on the sciatic nerves and causes neurological issues, right? We can have a hypertrophy of 
of the piriformis, which of course, you know, there isn't much room within the intrinsics of the hip. So any hypertrophy to the piriformis will also cause compression to the sciatic nerve. And then last but not least, you can have bio, biomechanical changes. So an example would be, and this is a rare, small subset of patient population, but essentially we have some patients who are born with a split piriformis where the sciatic nerve pierces through, right? And every time that muscle contracts, guess what? Um, they, it will compress on, um, on the, the sciatic nerve causing neurological signs and symptoms. So those are the three most common ways that we see piriformis syndrome develop. Uh, the etiology is of course, pressure on that sciatic nerve be, as it lies deep to the piriformis muscle. So what are the signs and symptoms? Um, most often radiculopathy. Um, and then you get some irritation of that sciatic nerve when the patient externally rotates the hip. And then we, the patient will present with a positive straight leg raise test as well in the clinical setting. So in terms of bursitis, um, there are many bursa about the knee, about the hip, and we're going to really just spend time talking about the trochanteric bursitis um, bursa because that's most often what we see. We already know that a bursitis is caused by increased friction. So at the trochanteric site, it's going to be increased friction of the TFL IT band junction most often, but it certainly could be caused by other other factors, right? Uh, most commonly though, it's TFL and IT band. Um, there are biomechanical factors or congenital influences uh, that can lead to a bursitis. Um, but most often, like I said, we see trochanteric bursitis. I'd say secondarily, you'll see this um, ischial bursitis or ischial gluteal bursitis. And this happens most often. PT people, um, if you have patients who um, work in a position where they are seated for an extended period of time uh, and it irritates the and they're um, pretty thin in the posterior section or the glute section and so it will irritate the ischial gluteal bursa right so bursitis inflammation of that bursa most commonly impacted bursa at the hip is trochanteric bursa all right these are the last slides um, that we're going to talk about and these most often happen to our adolescent um, student athletes so if you are wanting to work with middle schoolers or if you're wanting to work with high schoolers then these two pathologies don't tune out either way but these two pathologies are pathologies that you want to be able to identify or observe and inspect um, so the first one is a slipped capital femoral epiphysis um, so as the name implies uh, the the femoral head or something is shifting right all right so here's how it works most often it can be acute or chronic and or both and sometimes you can it, and a patient is actually can be born with this what we typically see is that the femoral head remains in the acetabulum but the neck component slips right or displaces so that's where we get that slipped capital femoral epiphysis so we get the slippage of the actual femoral neck not the head the head stays in its position but the neck starts to slip this is most common um, in adolescence, as I alluded to, um, and we see this most often in our obese, our obese um, student athletes because they, they're applying more pressure to that femoral neck. That makes sense, right? We also see it in our skeletally, skeletally immature student athletes. So those student athletes where the epiphysis hasn't quite um, completed, right? And so it hasn't um, formed completely to the femoral head. And so you'll see that slipped capital femoral epiphysis happening. And for whatever reason, males are more likely to suffer from this pathology. So uh, what, are, what are some of the signs and symptoms associated with a slipped capital femoral epiphysis? Most often they'll have limitations in hip internal rotation. Um, and we'll typically see um, a toe out gait. Um, so gait pattern with involved extremity externally rotated. So we'll see a toe out gait or a retroverted gait for those of you that are following along and are keeping notes. So what we can see here um, in, in this image, right? Um, our femoral head here, our femoral head here, and we can see the femoral head is in right its socket we can see how the neck has kind of formed to that femoral head but here what we see is we start to see that slippage of the femoral neck away from the femoral head and it's extremely painful deep-seated pain so you'll have to refer out to actually rule in this particular pathology um, so here again is what it looks like um, more I guess drawn in but you can see how there's a slippage right 
head stays in the socket, but you get a slippage of that neck away from the head. And most often the treatment is going to be um, surgical internal fixation. So you can see that there are screws into the neck and the head to um, secure that relationship. In terms of its classification, um, we, we, when we think about percent of slippage, typically between um, 34 and 66 is where we start thinking about um, some type of, some form of surgical interventions for these particular patients. Most often you, you guys take a deep breath. You're, this is probably going to be diagnosed relatively early on and caught relatively early. But you may have some patients who, um, for whatever reason, didn't have this diagnosed. So it will be up to you to look at their gait pattern, right? And assess. The last pathology is leg calvies per these disease. Um, here is where we talked about the ligamentum teres and its importance. Uh, we also talked about the importance of the uh, blood system supplying the femoral head and the femoral neck. And we talked about the circumflex arteries, right? Remember that? Okay, so with this particular pathology, um, we have ischemic lesions of the femoral head that develop. Um, and it's usually during the first decade of life. So between zero and 10, right? So if you're not working with peds, you shouldn't be concerned about this, but you certainly should if you are thinking about going into peds in some way, shape or form. But essentially what we have is a lack of blood flow to the actual femoral head. Most often it's as a result of some type of trauma. Um, in, in peds, I think of it this way, if you are if you have um, a baby coming out of the birth canal and the physician pulls or tugs on those feet, right? So we have a breech birth, physician's pulling that, that infant out and he tugs on the femoral head, creating a traction injury. So most often with these patients, um, they're going to have um, in internal rotation and abduction are going to be limited. But what's a little bit different about leg calvies, perthes disease, and slip capital femoral epiphysis is they're going to have pain in that medial thigh um, that radiates into the buttock. Um, and in some cases, will go into the suprapatellar region, right? So we're thinking, oh man, that's not just a thigh issue, a butt issue, but it's also going down into the knee. What we also know about leg calvies, perthes disease is on the next slide, you're going to see the head flattens. So as a result, the affected leg is going to appear shorter. So think leg length discrepancy, think measuring that, and um, you may be able to pick up leg calvies per thesis on that assessment. So here's kind of what it looks like. You have a normal hip here, and then you can see how as the head starts to die or soften, it's going to flatten, and it won't fit within that acetabulum, which causes many problems, right? It's going to limit the amount of motion at the hip. It's going to cause pain, lead to impingement, uh, many different factors, right? Um, so it's one of the reasons that it becomes extremely important to catch early on and to treat um, because it has long-term implications for your patients as they progress to adulthood. But in terms of prognosis, you're, it, the x-ray is going to be the key um, and you'll see decreases in that joint space because that, that femoral head is flattened. That is all, guys. We made it through hip pathologies. Um, hope you learned a lot. I will see you in lab.